Okay. So yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Tom. Um, you can find me on the internet at Tomayak, usually wearing a green hat like that. And um, yeah, today I want to talk about um, expanding what's possible on the web with Project Fugu. And um, I thought, how do I best illustrate this? Um, what do we do in Fugu? What, what even is the reason for doing this? So I thought um, I will show you something that probably some of you have experienced in the past. So you've probably been there. You see an amazing logo like that. And it's in PNG. And actually, it is in PNG. You can go to GitHub and uh, find it there. And you're like, wait, this should actually be an SVG. And um, this is text, so obviously it should probably be text in SVG, but let's just assume for the, for the sake of the example um, that this were something graphical. So you're like, hmm, this should probably be an SVG, so what do you do? So the usual solution is you pick your search engine of choice, you type in something like convert PNG to SVG, you pick the first or the second or the third, depends on how adventurous you are, result, you click on it, and you typically see a bunch of ads, and you see something that promises to do the thing you want, like convert PNGs into SVGs for free. Um, so you're like, nah, should I really trust the server? I don't know the service. Um, do I really want to upload this? But typically, you're just doing it because, you know, <laughs> you just really, really want that SVG. And, um, so you upload this, you pick, uh, you uh, press the convert button and you pray for the best that they don't do anything stupid with your files, that they actually delete it after um, doing the conversion. You press the download button and then you open it and very often times you end up with something like this and it's like, ah, come on, it was orange, it was not black and white. Um, they lost a lot of the information that was there. And you typically go like, there, there's got to be a better way, right? Because the tool that most of these conversion tools under the hood use, Potrace, is open source. So um, you can go to source, SourceForge, um, download Potrace, and just run it for yourself. It's a command line tool. Um, there's a lot of options. You can tweak a lot of things. Um, and yeah, really, really something should be possible to build on top of this. And um, that's essentially what it did. Um, so I'm introducing a tool called SVG Code. I did something really smart with the domain name svgcode.de. Um, so you can find it um, if you go to svgcode.de. And um, you can see it's not super pretty. I'm not a designer. Um, but it exposes all the features and more of Potrace, the command line tool, and um, allows you to just convert any image into an SVG. Sometimes you need to um, like tweak the thing a little. But usually, after some fiddling and some experience, which um, of the of the various controls to actually tweak, um, you get something useful. So here, I've converted the Web Engine's uh, Hackfast logo into an SVG that I could actually work with and live with. Um, what SVG code does differently than most of these server-hosted tools? Well, it's a PWA. It's offline enabled. It runs entirely in the client, so there's no server to trust. Um, I run it for free, so I don't put any ads on it, so there's no ads. Um, that invade your privacy or whatever. Um, it allows you to posterize images, so you can even convert photos and get something useful back. And then it sends all these different um, colors per channel to um, the Potrace tool, which then um, does the conversion into SVG, the tracing, and then it reassembles the whole thing into um, yeah, the resulting image. And um, unlike most of these online tools, it, expo it, it exposes really all, all of Potrace's options, including expert options. So you can really go um, as advanced as you want. Um, as I said, it's not meant to be beautiful at this stage. Um, I do expect uh, or accept, actually, um, design PRs if anyone here uh, is willing to make this more beautiful. Um, but the thing is, it gives you the full power of the command line tool um, but in a useful um, graphical user interface, so you can really interact with it and see all of the effects, more or less, um, as the tool um, makes the conversions. And um, it also integrates with yet another tool, which is SVGo, um, which allows you to um, optimize the paths to uh, minimize the file size as much as possible. 
So this for background on SVG code. Um, it's an installable offline enabled PWA. And um, yeah, how does it work? Well, it uses internally um, a plugin called Weed Plugin PWA. It's built on top of Weed, and um, it uses the vanilla JS template. And um, this Weed Plugin PWA <coughs> internally works with um, Workbox. So it's using the Workbox library to um, make all of this offline enabled. By offline enabled, I mean you can obviously install it. Um, so you can see here I've installed the application to my um, doc in, in Mac. And um, you can um, alt tap back and forward to it, of course, or command tap depends on what operating system you use. So um, it's, it feels like a real application. Um, so this is pretty much standard. You've seen PWAs before, um, I guess. But um, some of the things I think that make SVG code a little different are um, mentioned in the following. So there's a new project Fugu API that is called Window Controls Overlay. And um, if you're working on really small laptops, um, like if you remember those um, really tiny um, Asus ones, um, screen real estate really does matter. And um, typically also, like in many cases, when you look at um, the information that is in the title bar, you already know that you are running um, the SVG code application. There's no need for an actual title bar. So window controls overlay as an API allows you to move your user interface components up into the title bar area so you can gain some actual real estate um, on the screen. So you can see here um, on the right hand side, I've activated the window controls overlay so you can see that there's a little bit more useful screen real estate. So you can move up, for example, the menu buttons here. Um, a lot of applications like VS Code, for example, also could move up something like um, the, uh, the controls for um, switching between the different editors, for example. So there's a lot of um, degree of freedom that you can use here. And the idea really is, um, let's just make use of the screen real estate. Because most applications, when you um, look at the installed applications on Mac, on Windows, they don't really have title bars anymore. Um, they just move a lot of the content up there to make the most out of the existing screen real estate. So if you have this, how do you actually use this? Well, the thing is, um, in your web app manifest, you need to tell the browser that you want to use this. Um, there's a new um, display override um, field that you can use where you, where you can tell the browser, I actually want to use window controls overlay. And then, from your JavaScript code, you can um, listen to special, special events um, in the concrete, uh, a special event, in the concrete case, it's called um, geometry change. And this event fires when um, the geometry of the window changes. That is, let me just go back. Um, in the title bar, you have this little chevron here. So if you click the chevron, you can see that um, the title bar will be um, modified, so the entire ge geometry of the application changes. And, um, this event then allows you to um, change how your application looks like. So in my concrete case in SVG code, um, there's first this um, field that just tells me if the window controls overlay is visible. And if it is visible, I need to toggle my uh, class list for um, window controls overlay to visible or not. And I do this on menu and on main. What this does is like graphically, um, speaking, moving up the title bar area from here, uh, the, the, sorry, the menu, um, from here into the title bar so that it now appears here. And um, that's essentially um, all it does in this concrete case. So um, you need to just listen for this event and then adapt your um, existing user interface um, by switching some um, CSS classes, for example. So you just encode in your CSS the two possible positions using the title bar area or not. Um, right, so this is something that um, the user can control. Um, it's not something that will automatically be changed. There's some thinking, for example, um, Microsoft have been, I think, playing with this um, when you have a, a PWA on the store, um, that they would then automatically, sort of programmatically, click this chevron or even make it go away so that um, some PWAs that you download from the store won't have this um, title bar area to begin with, but already start with um, the fully um, controlled 
overlay um, variant. Um, but right now, if you um, just go from an application in the tab to an install PWA, you still need to manually click this. But um, a lot of developers complain about it. A lot of users don't really um, expect that this is something that they can change. So there's some thinking around, should this maybe be um, available from the start without a manual user activation? But of course, um, with all these uh, things, there's always a risk of um, someone doing something malicious with it. So there's a lot of um, thinking also from the security teams from the different browser vendors um, involved if this actually should be a thing or not. Um, but there's uh, thinking in this direction. Right, so the next uh, thing is um, I want to talk about the file system access API. Um, as you can imagine, um, since there is no server, there's no upload, but uh, you obviously still want to uh, open files um, with this application. So in the concrete case, you can click this uh, open file um, button here. And um, the file system access API is not yet supported in all browsers. So um, internally, we use a library called browser FS uh, access that um, is sort of a pony fill that allows you to use the file system access API when it's available. And it falls back to um, the input type file and the uh, a download um, attribute um, fallbacks if the API is not supported. Um, but on supporting browsers, what you can do is you can serialize the file system file handle that you get back from uh, calling the um, file open um, function in browser FS access, which internally then on the, on the um, file system access API maps back to window dot uh, show open file picker, which gives you this file system file handle. And what you can do is you can serialize this into index DB. So when the user reloads the application, you can bring them back to where they left off. So in the concrete case, you can see here, this application is asking um, if the user wants to continue where they left off with the file web engine hackfest logo.png. Um, and if the user says yes, um, they will be brought back right into the state that they were before with the open application. You can imagine for an application like um, VS Code, um, VS Code.dev is um, the uh, like web accessible version of VS Code. Um, this can be very useful if you can just reload your application and restore all the access to all the files that you had open um, in the past. Um, and by the way, this also works with drag and drop, which is pretty powerful. So if you drag and drop an, uh, sorry, an, an, uh, an image into SVG code, um, you can also get a file system file handle and serialize it into index.db. So how does this look like? Um, if you have a, a, a drop listener on this application, um, you get a drop event, which is then firing off an async, um, application, uh, async function. And um, you prevent the default, obviously. But then um, what you do is you get um, the data transfer items and pick the first one, because typically you only want to deal with one image. And um, if the item is a file, um, you can then put this file into the application. In the concrete case, I need to just put it into my input image field here. So this is input image, the right hand control here. Um, fire the uh, load handler, so this is more internal um, things from the application, how it works. But um, what you then get is from this item, there's a new function called get as file system handle, which gives you the file handle back, which you can then use to um, um, serialize this uh, handle to the disk or to, to index DB actually. So you can um, then, um, as I said before, when the user reloads the application, restore the state. Um, in a concrete case, it's maybe not super useful. It's more um, something that you can show off. Um, but you can imagine for a lot of use cases where you actually want to deal with um, the file that you've been working on, um, it makes a lot of sense to allow the user to restore from IndexedDB where they left off. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the async clipboard API. And um, the SVG code application is fully integrated with the operating systems clipboard via this API. What does this mean? Well, essentially, if you have the um, Mac OS Explorer, you can right click any image file and say, I want to copy this. And then you go back to the application, press Command or Control um, plus V, or um, in the app, uh, press the Paste Image uh, button, and the image will be pasted right into there. So what you did was you copied a file and then pasted that file into the application. So there's full integration in the paste sense, um, but there's also full integration in the um, copy sense. So 
Recently, the uh, Ice and Clipper API has gained support for SVGs, so you can um, make your um, like conversion in SVG code. In this case, um, that's the logo that I've converted. And then you can copy the SVG and paste it into another application. So here on the right-hand side, you can see this is an app called Boxy SVG, which is likewise a PWA. And you can paste the SVG from one application into the other. And um, like that really work hand-in-hand hand from one app into the other. And um, here you can make um, some modifications if you want to. So the uh, SVG code app is made for the conversion. Boxy SVG is made for the actual um, modifications that you still might want to um, do on this app. So the Async Clipboard API allows you to copy and paste back and forth from app to app. Um, how does this work? Well, in the case of SVGs, obviously um, they're images, but they're also textual um, images. Uh, text, it's a textual image format, so you can actually just look at the source code. And what the application allows you to do is you can just sort of do um, content negotiation, if you will. So on the uh, clipboard, you can put two representations of the same resource. Once um, as a uh, text string, so just the source code of the SVG, and then as an actual image. And um, the way you do this is um, in the application, um, well, there's, there's a copy button where you have a click listener on the uh, click event. And then you take the SVG code from the SVG output, just the inner HTML. This, this gives you a string of the uh, SVG. Um, then um, I run the SVG optimization step. Um, this is just um, application internal stuff. And then you can see here I'm creating two blobs, one in text plane type and one in image SVG plus XML type. And then I write these two blobs onto the clipboard as a new clipboard item with two entries. And it's an object that you, could, that you can see here that has um, the key of the blobs type, which is one time text plane, one time uh, image SVG plus XML. And um, then you have this represented um, in two formats. And then if you go to an application that takes um, text, you can just paste it and the uh, application will pick the textual rep uh, representation. Or if you are in a different application like Boxy SVG that can actually deal with images, it will take the image representation. And um, it's, as I said, sort of content negotiation, like the good old HTTP connect, um, just in the clipboard. And um, you can do this on the web now with the async clipboard API. Um, there's another API that's called the file handling API, which allows you to um, become a handler for files or even the default handler for files. So what do I mean by file handler? Well, essentially, the idea is if you have your finder here and you have an image file, you can right click and say open with, and then you can choose SVG code from um, the installed existing applications on um, your system. So you can see I've, I've got a ton of uh, apps that can deal with images here. Um, so SVG code is down there. It's actually there twice because once uh, it's installed from Edge and once it's installed from um, Chrome. Um, but what this means is if you are um, working on an application and you have um, dot something files, you can in your um, application say, I want to have an, a PWA that is the default handler for dot something files, which is of course something you would typically choose in a unique way. And people would then be able to double click the file in the finder or in, in the Windows File Explorer and the PWA would um, open directly. And um, that's a pretty powerful integration for a PWA. And um, to get that, you need um, to deal with what we call the launch queue. So in your um, window object, there's a new launch queue entry now um, that allows you to set a consumer. And this consumer gets a function as a parameter that has the so-called launch params. And in the launch params, um, there's a files array if it has a length of zero, you just return. Um, but else, you get from the launch params files handles back that you can then um, iterate over and uh, use these files to then um, yeah, essentially do the same thing that I showed you before, um, which is application internal. Um, but the core thing here is um, you can deal with this launch parameters um, in the launch queue at um, whatever time is suitable for your application. So you can wait until um, the application is loaded. And then the launch queue will just have the files that are passed to the application ready. So you can take them and then do whatever you want with them. Like in my case, just put them into the um, image, in the input image uh, file here. You can see I'm converting it to a blob URL. Um, and then just show it. And you can then also 
Um, C realized this file handle, so here, where is it? Um, here, you get the file handle, and you can also serialize this to allow the same integration as before so that you can reload the application and start um, the user from wherever they left off. Um, the next integration is with the WebShare API. And um, this works on Edge. It doesn't work on Chrome quite yet. But on Edge, um, what you can do is um, on desktop, you can work on an SVG, convert it, and then you can say, um, I want to share this. So you click this Share button here. And um, Edge will then show a dialog like this where you can, for example, if you have an email contact defined, um, you can send from um, SVG code right to an email recipient um, this application, or down there, it would also list um, a number of existing applications. I don't have a Windows uh, laptop when I uh, created a slide, so I just took this in browser stack, so it's a virtual um, emulated um, uh, Edge version, so there's no actual listed applications there, but if you were to run this on an actual Windows laptop, you would see um, your um, applications that are able to handle image files, and you could then share it directly with these applications. So you spare the user of saving the file, going to the file explorer, opening, opening, opening the file with this new application, and you can just have this direct sharing option where um, they can just choose the application that they want to, and like this, um, create for a very smooth user experience. Um, how this works is essentially um, with the navigator.share object. Um, so the rest is pretty much uh, the same as before. We get the SVG, um, we optimize it, I uh, <coughs> create a suggested file name, which is whatever I want. Um, so I can use, if I have the serialized, serialized file handle, or I can just make it untitled.svg. I create a new file. Um, so there at this stage it was a blob. Um, sorry, it was a string. Um, here it was a string. So I'm converting this to a file object. And then I create this data object here. So it's a thing that has a files um, a field and then an array of files. And then I just call, if the navigator can share this files uh, object, I just call the API with um, navigator.share. And like that, I can see if this works or not. And um, it's wrapped in try and catch because the user can always cancel, which will then throw an abort um, error. Um, right. This is the web share API, but then this also works in the other way around. So my application be can become um, the shared target. So if I have an image somewhere, for example, if I take a screenshot, I can then say, I want to share this to SVG code. And you can see here, this is from an Android device. And um, you can see down here is the SVG code application. So I can take the screenshot and then share it to the application, which means the file will open in SVG code. So that's the web share target API. How this works is um, with um, an entry in the web app manifest, where you say, um, share target, and um, then it's essentially just um, marked up as a form. So you can say my action should be um, svgco.de slash share dash target, which is not a path that actually exists. We will see this in a second, um, but it's a specially minted URL. Um, the method should be post. Um, the encoding type should be multi-part multi -part slash form data. And then you give it params, and the params are files, and the name is something image. And um, it should accept JPEGs, PNGs, WebP, and GIF. Um, I could add AVIF or whatever. Um, and that's essentially it. And then how do you deal with this shared target? Well, in the service worker. In a service worker, you just create this particular handler for the fetch event. So here, if the request ends with shared target, and if the method is post, then I enter this uh, special path here in my fetch handler. I uh, get the fetch event request form data back, and I, from there on, I can just work with the form data as with any other regular um, form data um, event that you, a uh, form data object that I get from um, the form data API. So you can get the image element and so on, and then just do whatever you want in the application logic. Um, so that's a couple of uh, APIs that I'm just using in SVG code. Um, there's a lot of other APIs that we've been working on in the context of uh, Project Fugu, which is why I've built what I call the Project Fugu Showcase. Um, if you go to the Project Fugu Showcase, it's on developer.chrome.com slash blog slash fugu dash showcase. Um, you can see a list of APIs. So you can see here this uh, blue list of chips. And if you click any of those, 
your broad right uh, onto an example selection of, AP, uh, of, of apps that use a given API. So you can, you can click, for example, on, um, I don't know, Web Serial, and then you get a list of all the applications that people have entered that use the Web Serial API. So like that, you can see um, what actual um, APIs, sorry, what actual apps do people build with these APIs that we're building in the context of um, the project. Um, you can also filter by um, just the names of the, um, of the project. And then, by the way, if you click this little um, share um, hashtag down there, you get a shareable URL so you can share and link directly to an application in the Fugu API showcase. Or you can also just link to any of the results here if you filter for one API. Um, so that's a Fugu API showcase. It's open so anyone can submit new applications. Um, if you go to the um, blog post um, where we introduced this, um, there's a form where you can just submit new applications. So if you encounter something really cool that isn't yet on the showcase, um, submit it, and it will be listed in the next iteration when we um, run the script to update the showcase data. So this is the Fugu API showcase, and we also have the Fugu API tracker, um, which allows you to see from all the APIs that we work on or that we're considering in what state they are and where they ship. Um, so if you go down, you can see there's different stages. Um, this section here visible on the screen right now is the APIs that we've shipped. Um, then if you scroll down further, you can see APIs that are currently in origin trial. You can see APIs that are in dev trial, which means essentially available behind the flag. And then finally, APIs that we haven't really um, worked on quite yet that are under consideration. And you always um, will see a Chromium implementation box. So if you click any of these lines, it will open and you will find um, a link where you can click to the Chromium implementation bug that you can store, and like that you're informed um, if anything changes in the implementation or so on, or of course you can just uh, use it to report um, bugs. And all these um, implementation bugs at the beginning typically point to all the um, resources that are available. So there's typically an, um, a spec draft that is available in the WICG. Um, there's an explainer, um, there's uh, yeah, well, the implementation bug itself, and um, sometimes there's some additional, for example, if there were uh, user studies, there's a link to um, this user study so that you can see um, what people want from or expect from this particular API. And with that, um, thank you very much. If you're interested in the slides, um, it's goo.gle slash web engines hackfest fugu. Um, or you can, of course, also just uh, scan the QR code. Um, my name is Thomas Steiner. Um, I'm Tom Ayak on Twitter if you want to follow up after the presentation. And I guess we have a couple of minutes left for Q&A. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, well. Is, is that an answer or a question? I hope it's not a question. It's huge. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I, I suppose you get this one a lot, but uh, I'll ask anyway. Why did you name the... It, it's... Is it also legally poisonous? <laughs> so um, it's an inside joke. Um, there was this one Simpsons episode where Homer orders fugu fish. And um, people who know fugu fish, it's a delicious fish, but only if you cut it right. Um, if you cut it wrong, um, it's poisonous, it's deadly, it will kill you. And um, of course, Homer thinks that he was, he's going to die, so he's uh, like living his uh, past, uh, sorry, his. Uh, um, supposedly last couple of hours, but then of course um, he, su he survives. Um, but it's a, kind of a, a hat tip to the point of what these APIs enable. Um, if you hold them right, they're super amazing. You can do applications like SVG code or the things in the Fugu API showcase. But um, if you hold them wrong, so let's say if you have the file system access API and you allow someone to up uh, upload um, or upload, to open um, their et cetera slash passwords file, that's potentially not good. So um, some of these APIs can be dangerous if you hold them wrong. In the concrete case, this is actually not possible. So the File System Access API has um, a block list of paths of the operating system that you just can't use with this API. Um, but in general, it's a head tip to some of these APIs can be dangerous. So treat them with care, handle them with care. Thank you. Uh, it, it seems that you answered my second question as well. Uh, but, but just to build on top of that, as you said, uh, a lot of these APIs uh, can have uh, unintended uh, consequences. Uh, 
I, I feel that it's uh, on, on the web platform, uh, it's easy for people to get tricked into opening a website without uh, uh, consenting to opening that website. Uh, so w what's the process like when, when you consider new APIs? Like, uh, how do you make sure that they, they aren't exposing people or sort of minimizing the harm? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's different categories of risk. Um, some of the risks are more severe than others. For example, um, if you allow someone to um, uh, have a, a web application that has write access to the Windows folder, um, this could potentially ruin um, your operating system installation. So that's just, in this particular case, a block list of file paths that you just can't use. There's no way around it. Um, so this is sort of a very strict um, security measure um, for the file system access API. Um, there's a lot of um, prompting. So um, if you want to open a file and then write to it, there's a prompt that tells the user, hey, this application is going to write to this file. Is this fine or not? Um, so this is another example, so prompt. And um, some APIs, um, for example, um, the, um, the web USB API, allow you to um, talk to hardware devices that are connected to um, the uh, computer. And um, there was one um, fault or bug where um, people could write to, um, just, I think I have one, yeah, here we go, um, to um, UV keys like this okay. um, that are USB enabled. And um, this was a bug, um, it was disclosed. Um, and in the end, we ended up just saying, okay, if this particular device category is plugged into the computer, it will just not be exposed to web USB. So that's yet another way of um, yeah, just dealing with um, the consequences of something that can be potentially harmful. Thank you. Uh, well, one question that we had on the chat, I, I think it's been answered somewhat, but I'd like to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you, you talked about window controls overlay. Mm -hmm. uh, would they, uh, would that, uh, the, the, uh, the problems that you're trying to solve with it, uh, would container queries solve that issue for you? Um, container queries might help you make responsive use of the space that you get, but without having window controls overlay, you can't write content into the title bar. So what you can do is you can use window controls overlay to get access to um, the area, and then use a container query to make responsive use of it. So you can imagine um, if you have a small, narrow window to show less controls than if you have a wide window, for example. I, I think we're, this, we're breathing too much. We we're need out of to, time? <laughs> we need to tone it down. No. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, another question we have is that Project Fugu looks like an incubator for many new APIs like the contacts API or the file system API that sort of bridge the gap between different platforms. Do you feel that someday we'll have some, some sort of parity or, or the, the, it's a, a common denominator of capabilities between different platforms and environments? Um, so we're seeing adoption for some of these APIs. For example, um, the WebShare API is something that is also supported by um, Safari. So if you load um, SVG code on an iPhone, you can actually share SVGs that you create with it um, using the WebShare API. Um, there's other APIs that um, just people, browser vendors, um, different from um, Chrome um, or Edge or Chromium in general, like the engine, um, don't want to implement. And um, that's absolutely fine too. So what we preach with all of these APIs, use them as progressive enhancements. So in the concrete case, if you look at the code, um, I'm not forcing the user to download any code in SVG code that their browser doesn't support. It will only load the supported set of features that are exposed on each um, platform. Um, will we ever come to a point where um, all browsers will agree? I don't think so, just because the differentiation between all these different browsers is just too big. Um, for some features, like for example, window controls overlay, if you think about Firefox, Firefox, unfortunately, in my opinion, stopped this whole notion of installable web APIs, uh, web apps, sorry, um, web apps. So if you don't have an installable web app, of course, there's probably no window controls overlay because you're running in a tab. So there's a precondition that just isn't met 
for some of these APIs. Um, there's other APIs, for example, Contact Picker, um, which you mentioned, um, which is implemented and works fine in um, Safari, but it's still behind the flag. So if you go to the experimental settings and activate it, you can see it just works fine. Um, it might be exposed at some point um, to developers or actual um, end users, um, but right now it's not quite yet. So I think um, whenever you work with Fugu APIs, progressive enhancement and um, yeah, in general, just very defensive programming is something that um, you should definitely um, consider and um, yeah, just use as a habit. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I, I found really interesting in, in the code examples uh, was the content negotiation in the, in the clipboard API. I, I, I had no idea that that was possible. Uh, does that work across platforms? Um, this starts to work across pl platforms. Um, so actually, if you look at the code of um, the copy um, and paste example, it's horrible right now, just because different versions of Chrome did different things, um, allowed for different things. Um, Safari allows for some things, but um, forces you to do things differently. So there's a lot of very active development right now in the editing um, working group at the W3C to unite on a shared behavior. And something pretty cool that um, you can have in the Async Clipboard API now is um, also um, what sort of enables raw Clipboard access. So to, um, to give you some background here, um, right now what we do is, for example, when we copy a PNG image, is that we re-encode it to make sure that there is no compression bombs. So in images, you can have compression bombs very easily, where if you um, copy an image, it can just, through whatever um, attack, become a massive file and that's something we just want to uh, avoid people to encounter on the web. So right now, um, we re-encode all the images um, that we see um, before we copy them onto the clipboard. Um, but with this new proposal, um, there will be a way to um, sort of copy all file types that you um, trust with the application. So it's called pickling um, for the async uh, clipboard API. And the idea is really um, you sort of mark these files as uh, or mark these, uh, these data uh, objects as um, web, coming from the web. And like that, um, people can decide if they want to accept these or not. The core idea is if you have something that runs um, in, in the browser, for example, if you imagine something like um, um, spreadsheets, Microsoft spreadsheets, um, uh, so Excel um, running in the, um, in the browser tab, um, they need rich copy and pasting. Um, they want to enable you to copy images and text and whatever, so custom HTML in the end and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of um, motivation from um, the Edge folks to actually get this right. Um, obviously also for, for Google, um, Google um, has the workplace um, tool of, uh, or set of tools for um, modifying Office kind of content. So there's a lot of joint effort in getting this sort of um, raw clipboard access, but in a safe way um, working. Um, yeah, that's very actively developing as we're talking, actually. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and on the operating system side, I, I know that you, well, Chrome's, for example, supports a, a number of very diverse operating systems, including basically all Linux desktops, which might or might not have, for example, a, a similar <coughs> implementation of a clipboard, which, uh, so how does it work with that? So in the end, um, it always hooks into the um, web operating system APIs that are available. Um, I'm personally not an expert in like how they do about the JavaScript side. I cannot talk to you about the operating system side. Um, but I know that whenever there's talk about how uh, to standardize a feature like um, raw clipboard access in a safe way, um, they always make sure that um, it's um, actually also practically possible. So specifying something that then cannot be done on a major platform is, of course, um, helpful to no one. Um, so there's um, operating system experts from all different operating systems um, typically involved in these um, discussions about standardization. Um, but how the concrete things work, um, you need to talk to someone who is actually on the operating system side. Um, but yeah, the, the objective is always to make it work um, on all operating systems, um, not just in theory, but also in practice. Uh, well, one mental model that I, I use when thinking about uh, Project Fugu APIs is that uh, e every one of them is sort of part of a big puzzle, right? And, and every piece is adding one more capability to the platform, uh, bringing things closer to the native. 
but there's only so much that you can do at a time, right? So is, what is, in your opinion, the, the one capability that, that enables the most things at the moment? So I think right now it's probably file system access um, because it makes a lot of things that people do um, on traditional applications possible on the web, like the VS Code case. Um, if you have Photoshop on the web, you want to edit an image on your disk. Um, you want to open, for example, from your camera a raw image file and then do something with it in the web application. Um, there's a lot of these um, use cases that seem trivial, but um, in the end they are not, just because there's files involved, there's drag and drop involved. Um, ideally, once you um, install a PWA and you have this magic moment of double-clicking a, a file um, of dot .something, whatever extension, and it opens in the PWA, you sort of forget that it's running on the web in the end. Um, I want to also highlight another point, um, because you mentioned um, uh, native applications. Um, Electron is a big framework for building um, native applications in a cross-platform way. Um, but interestingly, Electron is also a very, very um, active Fugu member in the sense of that they actively um, use Fugu APIs. This may sound counterintuitive, maybe, but um, a lot of people use, for example, um, Electron APIs um, to get access to Bluetooth devices. And um, before um, Web Bluetooth was a, was a thing, or Web Serial, for example, um, people had to pull in, um, like the Electron folks, had to pull in Node libraries that would work with Web Serial on the Node level. And um, by having web access to web serial, what um, Electron does is they get rid of yet another um, dependency. So each Electron application becomes smaller because they can internally just use the web exposed um, API. And um, that's something that initially was completely unexpected to me. Like why would Electron um, be a friend of Fugu if essentially some people could say this is like killing Electron in the long term because people can just do what they want on the web. But um, we're good friends actually and um, that's great. Because, yeah, all of these dependencies that they don't need to pull in makes their application smaller, and um, that's a win-win situation for both. Great. Thank you. Uh, do we have... Okay. I have a Yeah. So you, uh, you told uh, so, uh, a few times, like, Fugu interfaces or Fugu something, Fugu this, Fugu that. Does Fugu exist as a word, or maybe a namespace name or whatever, in the anywhere in the code or so how uh, does it exist in terms of something which is named Fugu when I program when I do some calls or something like this or it just is it just kind of the collective name for some interfaces which exist elsewhere um, it, it has started as an internal code name for this entire idea of um, bridging the gap between native applications and things you can do on the web so if you enable one more capability on the web um, you're closing this gap between native applications and web applications. And um, it sort of has become an um, umbrella term for this entire idea. Um, but there, you won't find anything internally in, in uh, Chromium in the source code um, that will be named Fugu something. Um, it's just a code name. Um, officially, um, the pro project is called the Capabilities Project. Um, but People sort of seem to like the Fugu idea. There's also the Fugu fish as the, as the icon. So um, I have it, I think, on the first slide. Um, la, 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 here we go. Um, so that's the iOS representation because I'm running it on Mac now. Um, but like the official um, Fugu fish is a very cute um, yeah, emoji um, from the Android uh, days. And um, people just like it and it sort of started to um, become a uh, self-running um, thing that people use as an umbrella term like HTML5 or Ajax. Um, so, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alex, for the question. Do we have more questions from the crowd? No? Everybody's tired. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, Thomas, for, for the amazing presentation. Thanks for listening. Uh, Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for having me.